The third article of the Creed and Luther's small catechism, after it asked the question, what does this mean? I cannot, by my own wisdom or strength, believe in my Lord Jesus Christ or come to him. For the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps me in the one true faith. I can't believe I remembered that. Not See, I shouldn't have blown it. You were all impressed for a minute. That's just a second. We are under the name of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are receivers and not doers. We are people to whom things are gifted. We are not the giver. Jesus Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, from him, through him, and to him are all things. We cannot believe in Jesus without first the power of God, the Holy Ghost, giving us the gift of faith. We are receivers and not doers, and everything that we then do are because we have first received. Our father Abraham takes his son Isaac, the son of the promise, the son he has waited for. He conspired to get a son his own way and got Ishmael, who was not the son of the promise. Finally, Isaac is born of the elderly of, of Sarah. They have the son that was promised, the son they yearned for, and God says, take him and sacrifice him on the mountain. Take him to Mount Moriah and build an altar and sacrifice your son, your only son. Imagine being Abraham. It's significant enough to keep in mind this real historical event that is recorded in the scripture is timeless. It is remembered by a lot of literary sources outside of the Bible. Muhammad stole this and put it in the Quran and had it be the other son, Ishmael, in a different mountain. It is absolutely foundational to Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. These couple of shepherd people in this place, on this mountain, and why? It says that God took Abraham, sent him up there in order to test him. But the tricky thing with God testing us in the Bible is that God is God and he already knows the answer and outcome of any test. Testing is done for us mortal people because we learn something from it, even if it's something we learn about ourselves. God knew that Job would suffer all and never deny him. The whole drama plays out because Job needs to realize that he will never deny God. Abraham's outcome is already known to God Almighty, but God commands Abraham to do this in order that Abraham should learn something and that you and I and all generations that follow will learn something. Abraham is not the doer. His obedience to take his son to the mountain, collecting the firewood, building the altar, getting ready to kill his only son, this act of overt obedience is not his own. He has been commanded to do it. He wouldn't do it unless he had faith. He wouldn't do it unless he believed. He wouldn't do it unless, as we find elsewhere in Scripture, he reasons to himself that God can raise the boy from the dead. I am only a mortal. I do not know the whole plan. God has said, do it, so I do it. It isn't a test to see whether Abraham would do it. God knows. It's there for posterity, the rule of obedience, the one already gifted faith of a type that he will follow through and do it, trusting in God. Trusting in God who made him from the dirt. Trusting in God who can raise the dead and will raise the boy if that is the purpose for it. And so even this horrific and bloody act, he is ready to do. Because he is a receiver and not a doer. Because he has received the spirit of obedience and the spirit of faith and belief. Everything that precedes this, the faithless do not behave in this way. Only the faithful, already gifted faith, are able to obey in this manner. Now this is exactly the problem with the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. And as I said, it is getting uglier and uglier in this last week as he has entered Jerusalem in this text, though we're not yet at Palm Sunday, and is in this argument and confrontation with those who reject the word of God. These are people that are not idolaters, not openly. They don't worship the Canaanite gods. 
They believe that they are perfectly wonderful descendants of Abraham and that they are keeping the doctrine of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Aaron. But they reject Jesus. They reject the teaching and the doctrine of Jesus because they have spent so many centuries manipulating and twisting the word of God, inventing their own laws and replacing the law of God with their own rules. The word of God has become foreign and alien to them. They are not of God anymore. They are followers of the devil. They have believed his lies and inserted all of those lies and blended them with the truth of God's word until they are alienated from God. And this is what Jesus keeps telling them. You say you are a descendant of Abraham. You are not. You are not of my father. My father, of whom you say he is our God, but you are far from him. You're of your father, the devil. That's who your God is. These two irreconcilable points of view will drive Jesus all the way to the cross to shed his blood for the sins of the world, but at the hands of those who hate and despise him. Only faith allows one to see the truth clearly. Only faith, gifted by the Holy Ghost, allows one to know the scripture, to know the truth, to recognize it when they see it. Real righteousness comes only from already knowing the Lord. We are not capable of doing a single good thing on our own, not a spiritually good thing. We might do nice things here and there for others, but if we do it for our own purposes or to please our flesh, it is not God-pleasing. <coughs> we are not capable as sinners dead in our sin and transgression of pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and doing good works by which we are justified. No one will be saved by their works because we're not capable of any good spiritual work apart from the Holy Ghost. Only the enlightenment of the Holy Ghost brings true doctrine, true faith, true prayers, true liturgy, true sacraments, all things made right and perfect as God has intended. When we go our own way and we invent our own rules and we invent our own doctrines, when we invent our own so-called righteous deeds, we drift further and further away till we are of our father, the devil. We are not the doers, we are the receivers. God is already at work in the world from the beginning, from the instant of our fall, giving us the promise of the Christ to come. And that's what everything that occurs at Mount Moriah is about. It points the way to the future and to multiple futures. When it is just Abraham and Sarah and their family and some servants and some flocks and Isaac, when Abraham takes his son to sacrifice him on the mount, and God intervenes and provides the lamb himself for the sacrifice. From these sort of Stone Age or Bronze Age shepherds and villagers, on that mountain in the fullness of time, the temple of God will be built. Yes, this is where Jerusalem will be. In the centuries to come, in the millennia into the future, this spot where he was asked to sacrifice his son, where God provided the lamb, is where God will build his temple. And God will give them the sacrifices and the rituals and the vestments and the songs and the psalms and the priests and the prophets and the whole method by which they are to have union and communion with him in the sacrifices and in the liturgy. On that same mountain. And already he prefigures it in the sacrifice of Isaac that all of that will finally come and it will also pass away. It prophesies the coming of the temple and the sacrifices and the rituals, but it also is the precursor of a human sacrifice. The one thing that God prevents Isaac from being sacrificed, but God also forbids human sacrifice in his temple in the future. But there will be one. When God becomes man and enters the world to die for the sins of the creation, not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could take away the sin, the stain of sin. I even misquoted the opening hymn. 
Jesus, God in the flesh, will come into the world and by his sacrifice, by his atonement, he will replace all of that. God is predicting the future at Mount Moriah, but he's showing them multiple futures. He shows them the temple that is to come, the rituals that will be, the priesthood and the liturgy and the psalms and the prayers and the kings and the kingdoms and the wisdom of Solomon. But he's also pointing to the coming of Jesus, that God will become man and then he, providing the lamb once again, a final time, will wash away the sins of the world. This joyous day has arrived and the Pharisees reject it and they do not believe in it because they're so certain that by their righteous deeds, by their made-up rules, by their fake doctrines, by their artificial practices, they are going to save themselves by their own merit and worthiness, by their own will and strength. They're going to do it, and they won't owe nothing to God. God then is reduced to a checkout person, the cashier that rings you up at the end of time and says, yes, you did enough good works, you wonderful Pharisee, you. Come on in, I am lucky to have you. When the real gospel and the real word of God is that we who are broken and sinful and dead in sin and transgression, we are found on this road of life and made alive again. We are found as walking zombies in whitewashed tombs and made into something living and vital. We are gifted that by God. We who are powerless are made whole by he who is power. By the one that is infinite and almighty, he can lift us up who are powerless and weak through no merit or worthiness in us. The God who across millennia points to what he's going to do, points not to the obedience of men, but the obedience of his son, of no less than himself, God made flesh to atone for the sins of the world. The idolaters of the world are out there rejecting and unbelieving, but worse yet are the false believers who have twisted the doctrine right out of existence. And Jesus will continue to butt heads with them all the way into the cross. Not because he hates them, not because he's angry with them in a sinful way as we might be angry. He desperately wants them to believe. He desperately wants them to be beaten down by the law so they can be lifted up by the gospel. He desperately wants them to be saved, but they persist and insist of being of their father, the devil. But we have one high priest, as Hebrews talks about, that one high priest who fulfills it all, fulfills everything that ever happened on Mount Moriah, who fulfills the promise all the way back to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15. Jesus the Christ, God made flesh, the true king of Israel, the true high priest of God's temple, the true lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, the one who became like us in every way but sin, who does what we can't do, who enters into the Holy of Holies, not even that earthly Holy of Holies where many priests died because of their own wickedness, but into that heavenly Holy of Holies where he stands forever as an arbiter before the throne and altar of God between us and judgment, setting us free from our sin, fulfilling everything. We're there in the presence of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and maybe even Ishmael for all that we know. There in the presence of all those that did believe, who were gifted the gift of faith, who made it there by no merit or worthiness in them, but only by the blood of the Lamb we gather together, as we even do here, for this Passover again and again. The blood of Jesus Christ that takes away the sin of the world, that cancels out all altars, all sacrifices, all of the old works, and replaces them only with himself. In Jesus' name. Amen.